So in terms of what about addiction, what's preoccupying me today, um, I think it's really the question of uh, the universal desire to feel good and that people all over the world want to do this. And then um, is there a way of educating the society to find healthy means of, of feeling good? In other words, getting uh, orchestrating their own brain chemistry in such a way that they have a sense of fulfillment and well-being without the negative sides of compulsive pleasure seeking. I think this is an enormously important task because uh, because we have more and more ways of getting high, and uh, the internet teaches people how to um, make drugs and how to procure chemicals that will interfere with their lives, but give it a very short and very powerful dose of pleasure. How do you uh, educate and create a systematic, systematic way of helping people to? feel good without the uh, deleterious effects of drugs and other kinds of harmful pursuits. We know now that the brain is a giant pharmaceutical factory that makes its own mind-altering chemicals. And in fact, people are not getting addicted to drugs. What they're really getting addicted to is changes in their brain chemistry. They find ways of changing their brain chemistry. The drugs certainly do that. But because the mind produces its own brain chemicals, I think the challenge for 21st century is how to help people to attain changes in brain chemistry that are going to benefit themselves and the society. And of course, uh, we can do that. It's a matter of understanding and developing skills to orchestrate our natural brain chemicals to result in healthy feeling states, happy feeling states, but to the benefit of society. And this is the 21st century challenge. Yeah, the question about yoga and meditation. Uh, in the chapter on natural highs, we have a section on uh, meditation and relaxation. And of course, now more and more uh, Western medicine, Western psychology is seeing that this is a very vital and important form of attaining a sense of well-being and, and pleasure without the problems associated with um, drugs or other kind of compulsive uh, pursuits. So, uh, yeah, meditation is a, as a matter of fact, uh, the way I see meditation, it's the, uh, it's the link between uh, psychology and, and, and brain chemistry. And, uh, if we can protect ourselves from interpreting the world in a hostile and negative way, which meditation can do, uh, we can bring about um, positive feeling states which can protect life and protect mental health. And so this is more and more an accepted practice in the West than the West, is understanding the benefits of meditation. How is the brain chemistry uh, working in terms of finding links with human problems and human happiness? What, what's happening in that field? Well, firstly, uh, we know more about brain in the last 10 years than in the whole history of medical science. It's really a tremendously uh, productive period uh, of human history in terms of understanding the brain. And um, uh, the science has all been on the side of um, the natural highs concept that I've introduced in this book, that, that we are capable through uh, behaviors and through uh, psychological attention, through meditation, to create positive changes in brain chemistry that will sustain life longer and lead to uh, happiness and well-being. So we're starting to have a science that really uh, validates the ancient traditions of Hinduism and yoga and Buddhism. And the West is really meeting East in terms of research on brain chemistry. There are a limited number of grants. There are government grants that support meditation in, in treatment in prison settings. Uh, but still, the mainstream is that these are more alternative ways of uh, approaching problems of mental health and, and uh, well-being. However, uh, uh, these, are these, are, these are considered to be um, important and valid tools in terms of psychology and medical science to help people deal with, with stress. And, and uh, we know, for example, that um, stress is d dangerous to your physical and mental well-being. And we also know, it's, it's widely accepted, that meditation is a protection against stress. And if you have too much stress, uh, you'll become sick, and uh, you may develop a depression, where you may become physically sick, and ultimately you may die prematurely. So meditation is, a, is understood as an important tool in this, and medical science and psychological science accepts that. I think the message has not been uh, widely distributed in the general population. This is coming. And of course, um, there's so much uh, emphasis on materialism and productivity that people forget. Uh, and 
I'm not educated enough to practice meditation, but it's very important. Well, there are, there are some uh, very uh, well-known and responsible people who have promoted meditation uh, in the West. Daniel Goleman, who is the behavioral science writer for the New York Times, uh, has written books on meditation and is a responsible science writer. He's very much knowledgeable and provides information about that. Herb Benson is a Harvard cardi cardiologist who uh, developed something called the relaxation response and studied meditation in the laboratory and showed that it really does improve cardiovascular function. So there are uh, studies that um, demonstrate the, the, the um, efficacy of meditation and, uh, and there is science that supports it. And, and so there are some, Joseph Goldstein is another one who writes about inside meditation and it's famous throughout the United States. And so a number of these people have made an impact. We do have meditation centers that people visit and we have retreats that people go to. Uh, but again, it's, it's a, a smaller population. If I ask my class, for example, in an American college classroom, I say, how many people meditate? And maybe 15% um, will, will say that they meditate. And of course, um, that's, it's not a giant population, but it's, it's, getting grow it's growing larger. People recognize the, the importance of it. And if I say, how many of you would like to meditate? Another 15% will raise their hand. So maybe 30% of the population is recognizing the importance. But of course, that's a college population. And, and maybe if you're looking at people who are working, people, they may not have the same awareness of it. But in, in an educated group of people, we have widespread acceptance of meditation. Parental role is, is twofold, really. Uh, of course, we know that we have to love children and nurture their creativity and their spontaneity and uh, all the positive things that they do and, and support them and affirm them. But the other part of responsible parenting is limit setting, and it's really um, equally important. So children uh, benefit when they have parents who set limits on them. No, it's not okay to stay out uh, past midnight if you're a 12 year old. And no, it's not okay to go places where we don't know where you're going. And so the limit setting is a very important part. And one of the things that I find with parenting is to be a good parent doesn't mean that you're the, you're the child's friend. They don't want you to be your friend. You're not their friend, you're their parent. And so a lot of times parents don't want to make their kids angry at them because they're treating them like friends. But it's really the parenting role is to also uh, provide modeling and, and limit setting. And that's what parents, I think, need to maybe sometimes they can think a little bit more about that. A good parent is a person who can uh, say no to a kid, too. Uh, relative to schools, yes. I mean, it's, it's such a part of the fabric of everyday life, the availability of drugs and other kinds of um, immediate pleasure uh, producing activities. It, it really needs to be uh, introduced from kindergarten through high school. And it's something that should be tackled in all the relevant classes, in the biology classes, and classes that talk about even the history classes. I mean, to bring up this topic and to explore it in the, in, in the relevant areas of the topics that touch upon addiction, biology, health, uh, education, uh, psychology classes, history classes, the story of uh, pharmacology, chemistry, all those classes can touch on drugs and create intelligent discussion about it rather than just limiting it to a scare lecture. Scare lectures don't work, so it should be something that is, that is really woven throughout the fabric of education from kindergarten all the way up to the higher education. There's only so far you can legislate addiction out of existence. Um, uh, so really, what, information is not sufficient. I mean, if, if we just gave information, everybody would be wearing seatbelts, um, everybody would be practicing safe sex. Nobody would be smoking cigarettes, and nobody would be abusing drugs, because everybody knows that information. So the missing part is, is skill development. That, that, uh, what needs to be taught is uh, how to manage your feelings, uh, your relationship with other people, and how to be uh, concerned about society. And those are skill sets. And so if people have those uh, skill levels, then they can take advantage of the information. But without those understandings of how to get along with yourself, how to get along with other people, and how to get along with the society, then the information is not sufficient. So we have the concept of employee assistance programs and, and how should the employee the employer assist the uh, employee. And um, I think there is a role uh, of employee assistance programs. Certainly economically, uh, 
to um, to fire and have to retrain uh, another employee that may have a, a great uh, del a deleterious economic impact on a, on a company. So it's to their benefit to assist employees, and not only the treatment of um, addictive disorders, but to provide them with prevention information, health information. So a healthier workforce is going to be more efficient and more productive. So the the employee the employer has an investment in. in uh, in not only uh, intervention and treatment, but also in prevention. So a healthy company will provide all those services. And of course, um, there is a time where uh, the, the employee would, would um, be dismissed or fired if they were not able to comply. But um, certainly, this is a, a positive step in society is to provide a support system. Sometimes the um, employer is the only support system that the person has. And so the job is very important. And it may be the last thing that uh, the employee, the, uh, the person loses. They may lose their family, they may lose um, aspects of their friends and their health. They hold on to the job. So this is a really kind of a last uh, hope that they have. And the employer has some benefits also in, in, in trying to maintain the employee. And in the treatment, we, we insist on the personal responsibility that and really, relapse prevention is based on recognizing the triggers of relapse and taking personal responsibility for preventing them. And of course, there are external factors, and so we have to we recognize them, and there are internal factors. So the person who has uh, proper treatment will recognize uh, that their response to the external factors is the problem on how they. And there are things that that can harm us and can trigger us, but it's our bottom line is how we respond to them. And really there are five triggers for relapse and in general. It's uncomfortable feeling states, it's um, uncomfortable uh, relationships with other people, it's uh, negative influences from friends, uh, a change in self-image where you can lose a job or get fired or you get divorced, something happens in your life, and also a, um, a sense that um, uh, when you go back to a situation where you used to use the drugs and all of a sudden they could, if you have a condition, a feeling of uh, withdrawal or desire that is actually changes in brain chemistry related to the, being back in that position, situation where you were where you used to use. Well, those are the five basic reasons for relapse and, and a, a good treatment center would provide skill development and practice and, and dealing with all those situations. Look, the addiction, um, the definition of addiction is compulsion, behavior characterized by compulsion, loss of control, and continuation despite powerful consequences. So it really doesn't matter whether it's drink, money, sex, cars, calories, cars, cocaine, internet. If a person loses control over their autonomy, their freedom of movement in a society, and that will change according to um, what society presents, and what kinds of opportunities there are in the environment. And so, uh, but I think the bottom line is that there are commonalities across all the um, activities and drugs that provide uh, very strong doses of pleasure and that depending upon the time and the history and the opportunity the person has that will get addicted to one or the other, then I don't think we can exactly say uh, which ones are going to be the most problematic um, uh, in any period of time. But right now, uh, it seems like the uh, uh, nicotine is, is really the largest presentable, preventable cause of death, I mean, in terms of, I call it the world's antidepressant. I mean, I, th I would say that a third of the world is hooked on nicotine. And there's probably no drug in the world that uh, will ever be invented that has the antidepressant immediate uh, um, qualities that nicotine has. So this is, you know, this is, I think, if I were uh, writing a book on it, and what would be the target of change would be nicotine would be one of the most important areas of abuse, drug abuse in, in the whole world. Is the marketing always makes a promise that the product is going to make you more like how you really want to be. Right? Every time you have a marketing scheme, I mean, what people only want to be, they want to be more sexy, they want to be more rich, they want to be more, uh, have more status, they want to have more of a power. And every time you see a drug marketed or a cigarette marketed, it has a picture of somebody that's doing what you want to be, right? So it's going to, it's going to close the gap between how you see yourself and how you want to see yourself, right? So that's, so in, in the sense of marketing this book, for example, what I'm saying is that this can do all those things. It can make you how you really want to be. It can give you, give you status. It can give you a, a prestige. It can make you 
uh, seem more intelligent uh, in terms of how you function. It, it can give you a better life, and those are the things that you want. So I would say that work has a lot of potential. Okay, so the first page of this book is a Sanskrit poem uh, written uh, uh, well, many hundreds of years ago. Look to this day for his life, the very life of life. For yesterday's already a dream, and tomorrow's only a vision. But today, well lived, makes every yesterday dream of happiness, and every tomorrow a vision of hope. So the spirit of this book is really to be present, and to be minding your thoughts, understanding what your, what your thoughts are, and being able to make choices, healthy choices, in terms of your life. I think maybe it needs to focus on the, the, uh, the like the natural highs. I mean, it, look, it's not as sexy as somebody going to a prostitute or getting into trouble. Or the media likes to focus on all these harmful and hardship things that happen around addiction. But I think the media should do, uh, you know, more of a job of reporting the positive things and, and um, that you know people can really do. And I think that there's a maybe they should take on more responsibility in that way rather than just trying to get um, you know an interested uh, listenership who gets drawn by the um, the sensationalism of addiction. I think there's, there's something that we need to do in, in a more um, responsible way. And I really do think that uh, Obama should look at this and, and the government should look at this. And, and uh, you know, I've had some success with that. I had a program uh, for teenagers that I ran for 10 years where I offered them natural highs. I was funded for $2 million by the government to offer them music, art, dance, poetry, and getting natural highs as alternatives to drugs and crime. It was very successful. We had thousands of young people that went through the program. Uh, it makes sense to give them better things to do. I, I wrote an article called Better Than Dope. I mean, what is better than dope? I mean, something that makes you feel good, that benefits you and the society at the same time, and then you have healthy alternatives, and that's what this book represents, is better than dope. What is better, what's better than do than take drugs? that people can become addicted to a fantasy of a, of a world of um, uh, peace and, and uh, that the devil is, is uh, removed from the, from the world by forcible means. And I think people get addicted to that fantasy and then they uh, become sometimes um, uh, a danger to themselves and the world around us. So I think terrorism can be thought of as an addictive behavior. And there's a whole a section of this book that deals with um, addiction to Fantasy. I think there are um, people, and the internet is one of the main uh, recruitment devices of promoting this fantasy that by forcibly removing your enemy who represents the devil, there'll be peace on earth. And this is a, to me, it's a fantasy addiction. It doesn't really, it's not a proper way to think of it.